Good morning, Radiate and Ablaze. Uh, it's fun to uh, be here with you again. Uh, I'd rather be with you in person than in a video, but uh, this is the means by which um, God has us receiving His Word right now, um, individually, but then corporately through videos. And so I'm excited to be here, excited to be sharing. We're going to be in Mark 1 and 2 this morning, Mark chapter 1 and chapter 2. So go ahead and take this time now to uh, turn there, and uh, we'll read a passage together here in a minute. But to start, I wanted to tell you guys a story. So in, in high school, I spent uh, many a week, uh, in the summer especially, but also throughout the school year, in, in Haiti, the country of Haiti. Haiti is a Central American country, and in the uh, Western Hemisphere, uh, the poorest uh, country in, in every regard. Um, infrastructurally, uh, GDP-wise, fancy, fancy way of saying uh, their production and the money that they make. Um, they're they're the poorest. And then in in 2010, in January, there was a huge earthquake um, that hit a country that was already the poorest and already had infrastructure problems, and it compounded and multiplied. Um, Spent many a trip there, um, learned a lot about what it means to serve the Lord overseas there, um, and just grow uh, grow with other people in that. But uh, where my story comes in is uh, just in that anarchy state, right? Um, there's almost no authority and no infrastructure like we would assume here in the United States. So a friend of mine who lives and works in Haiti, uh, they have a ministry um, that is a school for kids um, who have no access to school. And they were looking to buy a property, right? Uh, a house uh, with a property for, to house the school. And so they went to the property, they talked to the owner um, who met them there, and they kind of got a tour and figured things out, haggled on the price a little bit, and things seemed to be on the up and up. Like they were looking squared away, things were good. So um, they continued in conversations, went back and forth a couple more times, and then they settled on a price. And then my friend and the board of that ministry um, gave the money, right, paid outright um, through generous donations and other things uh, to the owner to uh, take over that property and have as their own. Uh, they even started moving things in and, and perhaps even starting an addition on the back half to make some more classrooms. And out of nowhere, uh, someone turned up and said, what are you doing to my house? What are you doing to my house? And I thought that was funny. I was like, what do you mean? Like, you bought it from the owner, right? And turns out, in retrospect, in Haiti, uh, anyone can turn up if they have a family connection and claim to be the owner. Um, and then two, um, you can almost never guarantee who someone is, just what they claim. There's no infrastructure to claim like an ID or a birth certificate or something else. So... In that sense, it was kind of unknown, the identity of that first seller. And they ended up buying a house from someone and paying the full price for it from someone off the street who just showed up at the house. It wasn't theirs, right? And that's just flabbergasting to us. Like, when I think of buying a house, of course it's going to be from the owner, and of course someone's going to check that. Um, and if not, like, they'd be committing fraud and they'd go to jail. But in Haiti, um, where there's no infrastructure, not so much. And I, I think... What this story gets at that we're trying to look at today um, is authority, right? The, the man who first sold the house to my friends didn't have enough authority um, to sell the house, but my friends trusted his word and got burned by it, right? They bought a house that wasn't for sale and wasn't that man's uh, right to sell, right? And, and so as we approach Mark 1 and 2, the question we're asking is, uh, why does Jesus' authority matter? Or does Jesus have authority, put another way? And the reason why is this, because the results, right, or or the promise you're counting on, you're trusting in, uh, like my friends were counting on that he was the owner, um, is only as trustworthy as the person promising it, right? The results or promise that you're counting on is only as trustworthy as the person promising it. And that brings us to our main point for this morning, which is this. Uh, because Jesus has complete authority, we can trust both his gospel and his promises. Um, again, because Jesus has complete authority, we can trust in both his gospel and his promises. 
So first, we're going to see um, in John 1 uh, that Jesus shows his authority through his word. Uh, Jesus shows his authority through his word. So let's go ahead and read together. We're going to start in John chapter 1, uh, verse 21. Now read along with me. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And all were amazed, so they questioned among themselves, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And so there's a lot here. Um, it's a short passage. There are many surrounding passages. But a couple things to note. When you look at the Gospel of Mark, check out chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, just one page back or even just a paragraph back. It says this, uh, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark even sets up by verse 1 where he's headed. He's, he's going to show that Jesus has all authority and, and why, that is, because Jesus is the Son of God, i.e. The, the Messiah, the promised one who's been coming, and uh, the one that the people of Israel have been waiting on, right? And then the gospel being his good news, his message um, to the world. And so Mark sets that up pretty blatantly at the beginning and jumps right into things. Um, he moves from scene to scene pretty quickly and uh, jumps into the, some things that really point us to Jesus' authority. Just a couple before our passage. Um, one, the baptism of Jesus, right? We see God the Father uh, speak down from heaven and convey that authority on Jesus. It says in verse 11 of chapter 1, a voice came down from heaven, you are my beloved son, right? Authority, a son of the Father. And with you I am well pleased with an endorsement from the Father as well. So we see Jesus' authority there. Um, and then through the temptation of Jesus, um, in other gospel accounts, in Luke and Matthew, we see Jesus uses the authority of God's word um, to repel the temptation of the devil. Um, and so we see him use um, truth and authority there. And uh, this is just another instance of that, right? So we come upon... Jesus, on the Sabbath day, in the synagogue, right, the church of that Jewish religion, um, and was teaching, right? And what does verse 22 say? It says, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes, right? So even in his word, right, in, in the teaching that he was giving, using his words, there was authority given there. And the reaction uh, really helps us to understand this. They were astonished, right? The people were astonished by his teaching because he taught as one that had authority, unlike really the normal authority of the day, uh, the scribes, right? Those who had studied the word of the Lord and the law. This reminds me of uh, first, uh, excuse me, John 1 and the connection to Genesis 1 as well. Uh, John 1 says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Right, and so a couple things to draw on there. Um, the word in that passage is referring to Jesus. We see that at the end of the verse. It says, uh, the word was with God, one, and then was God as well. Um, so we see a, a reference to the Trinity here, that there are many persons in the Trinity. And then later on in chapter one, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Jesus, right? So we know that the word is Jesus, but even so, we realize that Jesus is the embodiment of his word, right? Like the, the words of God are fulfilled in a person, and that's why they call Jesus the word, right? He's the word of God in the flesh, right? Um, and fulfilling those words that God had promised before. The connection to Genesis 1, we see um, in the beginning, right? Which refers us back to Genesis, right? Creation. Um, in the beginning, what was it that was creating? the world. Um, God, right, you think of, 
but more specifically, God's word. He said, let there be light, and there was light, right? God didn't um, have to build something with his hands. He didn't have to uh, create something with strength of his might. He created things with his word, right? And his word being Jesus. And so we see those connections um, to this here, that when Jesus speaks, we take him at his word. Um, another way to look at this, um, even more personally, is if I came up to you, let's say the next time we hang out at church, whenever that will be, um, what if I promised you a million dollars, right? What, what would you say? If I walked up to you and I said, hey man, if you give me a high five right now, I will give you one million dollars, right? One million dollars. And Hopefully your response would be to be a little skeptical of that. Um, excuse me, Marcus, like I know you have a full-time job, but I don't think the church pays you a million dollars. So how are you gonna, how are you gonna own up to that promise that you just made me? Uh, that'd be a pretty right response. And then uh, conversely, uh, think about if Bill Gates came up to you and said, hey, I'd, I'd like to promise you a million dollars if you give me a high five. Now, maybe you'd still doubt it because who would give up a million dollars? But at least in Bill Gates's case, you'd realize, oh, well, he definitely has a million dollars, actually much more than a million dollars. So he's at least capable of keeping his word. He's capable of keeping his word, but it remains uh, that we would have to trust Bill's character. Um, he's, he has the ability to, but does he have the desire to and the drive to follow through? In my case, no question. I can't even achieve that. Um, but in Bill Gates' question, is the question of will he remain trustworthy? To his word. And so I think this is where the authority of Jesus in his word, especially his, his words in the synagogue, are, are really important. Um, there are some things here for us that uh, bear huge weight on our lives. First, uh, take Jesus at his word. Right? Take Jesus at his word. Um, speaking as one who had authority, people were astonished because they realized he was claiming to be God with these assertions that he was making. He was teaching as one who had authority, even the authority of God, right? And Mark spells that out in verse 1, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? So it, the writer is pretty, pretty explicit with that. But that's one of the reasons why we take Jesus at his word is because he has ultimate authority because he's God, right? Another ramification of this is how you read your Bible, right? Take the Bible at his word. Why? Because it's the word of of God. Um, I think back to when Josh was listing for us uh, the reasons why we should study Philippians back in the day. And the first one he had was, we should study Philippians because it's the Word of God, right? Uh, at a bare minimum, right, no matter what your favorite book or verse is in the Bible, each page, each word is from the Lord. And that's why it's relevant, not because you like it or because you feel like it has a direct application to you even though it always does, by the way. It's because it's God's word. It's the word from God. Okay, so in this first part of this passage through his teaching, we've seen that Jesus shows his authority here and a ton of other places in the Bible through his word. Um, another way that we see Jesus's authority uh, in the second half of this text is that Jesus shows his authority through his deeds. So not only his word, right, as we've seen, but also his deeds. So let's look at the second half of the passage, see if you remember. Um, and immediately in the synagogue, there was a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? You have come to destroy us. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. So, uh, get this, right? Even a demon, an unclean spirit, recognizes who Jesus is. Uh, this is verse 24. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. He's referring that to that Jesus is God, the Holy One of God. Who's holy? Who's, who's the definition of holy? God is, right? And so even the demons tremble and know who Jesus is. And that's why two or three times in this passage, we see that the people, right, the synagogue onlookers are astonished by this. It says it after his teaching and it says it after his, 
casting out of this demon because he's claiming to be and revealing to them that he is God. It's a bigger deal than just he gave a good sermon. You know, it, it carries more weight than that. And then, to our point above, uh, realize that it's not just Jesus claiming to be God in his word, right? Like, I can go around claiming that I'm God, or I can go around claiming, to reference our earlier illustration, that I have a million dollars, but there's no way to prove that unless I show you or prove it with my deeds, right? If you don't believe me and then I come home with a Lamborghini in my driveway, then you're like, oh, okay, maybe he does have a million dollars. Um, same thing here, right? Jesus says it and confirms it in his word, in his teaching, but also shows his authority through his deeds, right? They say later on, um, verse 27, what is this? A new teaching with authority, Jesus' words, and then he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So even in the spiritual realm, his words and his commands, his deeds, reign true. He has authority. He has authority. Um, so think about this. Think about this. Why does this matter, right? That God's words and his deeds are going together. Um, realize that God has a history of proving his word through the scriptures, right? Um, many, many, many years are represented in this book, right? If you think about the Old Testament and the New Testament and all his promises to Israel that get their resolution in Jesus Christ, our God keeping his word with his deeds. To keep his word, his promise, his authority, he sent his son, who is also God, to accomplish his will on the earth, right? And so we've seen time and time again throughout scripture that God is faithful, that God is faithful. Uh, think about it this way. Think about it this way. Uh, there's an old movie. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. It's an old one, uh, especially for you middle schoolers. It's called Remember the Titans. Uh, it's a football movie about a team that um, has both black people and white people on the team when, in fact, that was just not the norm when a separation, school-wise even, uh, because of race was a thing. And there's this crucial moment where there's a black guy snapping the ball, he's the quarterback, and there's an offensive lineman, people who are supposed to protect the quarterback, who's white, his name's Ray, and that offensive lineman refuses to block, refuses to help the quarterback. He lets another enemy player in, and that enemy player crushes the quarterback and really breaks his hand um, so that he can't play anymore. And so, in word, Ray was on the team. In word, Ray was for the quarterback, and in word, he even denies that he let someone through. However, it's shown later in the movie uh, that Ray did let him through, and a captain of the team, who's also white even, uh, gets Ray kicked off the team because of this uh, deceit, right, and not being consistent. And this this is what it's what's at stake with Jesus' words and his deeds connecting, right, with God's word and his deeds connecting. If God says something but doesn't follow through, then how can we trust him, right? And in that sense, if God promises something that he can't hold up his end of the bargain on, right, he's not capable of, then how do we trust him, right? How, do, how can you trust Marcus who does not have a million dollars to give you a million dollars. You can't, because I can't come through on that promise. But here's the thing, with the God that we know and serve, that all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing God, one, he's capable of keeping his promises, even, even as big as they are, um, he's strong enough. And then two, he's trustworthy enough. Uh, his character, his, his words and his deeds line up, right? That's called integrity, right? Our God is uh, one with integrity. Another way that we talk about God's integrity is his holiness. Uh, there's no one like him. He is consistent, consistent. So what does this mean for you, right? I've, I've hopefully uh, expounded on something that you already agree with, that God is trustworthy, um, that we should trust him because he's faithful. Um, why does this matter, right? And, and here's, here's the why. Um, in a hard situation, in a situation where you don't know what's going on around you, uh, maybe mom and dad are fighting, maybe 
there's a global pandemic and you don't know why there's hurt in the world. Uh, maybe there's a sticky situation going on and you want more answers than you have. Maybe um, there's a huge letdown that you were hoping to come through. A whole host of different things. The question is, uh, can we trust God in, in these times? Is God watching out for us? Is God keeping watch? And uh, the Sunday school answer is yes, he is. But, but how do we know that? It's reminiscent of Psalm 42, um, where Josh is taking us in the Psalms of Summer. It says, uh, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Right? Uh, we ask these questions often, whether we admit it or not. Is God faithful? Why is my soul um, disturbed and downcast as a result of these things? Uh, the rest of the verse in Psalm 42 says this, uh, Put your hope in God, for I will again praise Him, my salvation and my God. The reason why Jesus is authority, the reason why God's authority matters, is because it means we can trust Him and that He's capable of keeping His promises. So think about that. As you approach hard situations this week, you're not alone in them, one. And two, God's promises to you are both, uh, he's both capable of and willing and has the, enough integrity to keep those promises to you. Um, second, uh, in conclusion here, um, think about this. I want to take you to uh, Matthew 28 to close. It's a popular passage called the Great Commission. Uh, verse 18 in Matthew 28 says this, um, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Uh, sound familiar? Right? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? To Jesus. Right? Verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And so another ramification that we haven't talked about yet, but is enormous, is that uh, God has the authority over your life. If you claim to follow Christ, he's not only your savior and your friend, he's also your Lord. In that, if God asks you to do something, uh, the answer should be yes, because he has authority over your life. And so when God asks you to spend your life as Matthew 28 would say, sharing this good news with others and bringing them along in the teachings of Jesus to obey all that he commanded us. Um, that's a lifelong pursuit and really reorients when you think about what's next. Uh, this is what's next for me. I don't know exactly how that looks, but I know that I will be sharing God's message and bringing others along. And hopefully um, we've achieved a little bit of that this morning. Let's, let's pray together. Father God, I'm thankful for your choice of us to be your children. God, because you have all authority in heaven and on earth, that has ramifications for our lives today uh, in two ways. And one, that we are comforted by your presence. Your promises will ring true because you have the capability of keeping them and because you have the integrity to keep them as well. Um, and so we lean back and we trust in those promises despite hard situations all around us uh, often throughout our lives. Additionally, God, it requires of us obedience to you because you have all authority in our lives. So God, I pray that as we approach this world and realize that there are so many people who don't know who you are, that we'd be taken captive by this command of yours in Matthew 28 to share your gospel and your good news um, all over the place. And even to those who already know it, to train them and produce in them a heart that wants to follow after your commands. God, we love you because you're good. And God, help us to obey your commands because you have all authority. We love you, God. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.